Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right, everyone, you're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? I uh, early voted on Monday. I uh, did my civic duty, and I waited in line for about 40 minutes. I think turnout might be high this year. I think so, too. It was a long line yesterday for me, so I'm going to try to go uh, go during lunch today. Look at us being good citizens. Oh, it's it's for more than that, trust me. (laughs) Well, Tom, let's get into the election, and then we can talk about some of the impacts, including tax policy uh, after that. Uh, You want to set the scene of what your expectations are and what we're seeing in markets and how things are playing out now? Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll talk about the hot topic a couple weeks away, uh, the election. So let's start with some of the polling. There's an interesting site that I I follow called Polymarket, where you can bet on election and various other things. You know, I don't know how accurate it is. I don't know how accurate polling is in general. I mean, 2016, it was wrong. 2020, it was correct. So can't can't completely dismiss it. Um, but Polymarket has Trump now up by 64%. Um, and it was pretty, She was, Kamala was up by a good amount up until the 60-minute interview. And that's when the betting odds just mm-hmm. took off for, for Trump. But you know, I was reading an article this morning. I wouldn't put too much emphasis on uh, national polling. Uh, as much as I would looking look, looking at the swing states, which is Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, which I think is, in my opinion, the biggest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Nevada, and Arizona. Yeah, well, you know, one comment on poly market, it's actually a foreign uh, organization. And so nobody in America is betting on that. It's all foreign money. But there's one in the United States called Predict It that also does the same things. But the polling data is pretty clear that Trump is ahead. Um, you know, the thing about the odds is, you know, favorites get upset all the time in sports. So even if you have a money line of minus 500, sometimes they lose. So a 65% chance is the likely outcome, but it's not a guaranteed outcome. So even though he's up in theory, 65, 35, it doesn't mean that he's going to win. Uh, So we still have to wait to the election. Now the polling nationally uh, with the way the electoral college works, she kind of needs to be ahead three or four points nationally in order to win. And right now it's tied. Uh, it's essentially a dead heat. And so that actually favors him with the way that electoral politics works. And in the Senate race, it looks like the Republicans are ahead in some key states to definitely get the majority. And the House will probably be decided, I don't know, two weeks after the election with a few recounts and fights over that. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. I think if... Uh... You know, the, the Republicans might have might be able to take the Senate with with one seat. But I think either way, it's going to be p- pretty, pretty split across the board, which, you know, I think will be good for overall overall markets. You know, I was reading an article this morning about just our, our deficit, which is just ballooning. And none of them, Trump or Kamala, has a plan to reduce the deficit. And if, you know, it's a pretty divided uh government. I don't think they're going to get a lot of legislation passed to whether it's Trump or or vice versa to to increase the spending and, you know, boom the market because the deficit's the biggest issue we have in in the country, in my opinion. Yeah, at some point it should be. Uh, I think that that'll happen. Uh, As far as outcomes, the base case of what we're expecting right now, based on polls and other data we look at, uh, we are expecting Trump to win the White House, the GOP to keep the Senate and likely have a divided government with the House being led by the Democrats. So that divided government historically has been a pretty good thing for markets. Uh, One comment I would say is in Trump's first term, everybody thought the stock market did great. Um, And it did up until the last part where we had the COVID sell off and it ended up okay for that year, but it averaged about 12%. Uh, And under Obama, which was considered not so great, uh, it averaged about 12%. So that to say that 
regardless of party affiliation, it seems that the market tends to just go up over time and equities seem to do well regardless. Yeah, of I time. think there's going to be a knee jerk reaction either way for, for two weeks, up or down. Um, your guess is as good as mine for who, who takes office. We have a million different charts we can look at historically. And I think we talked about this in the last podcast. Um, you know, if, it, if the incumbent is going to win, the stock market tends to go up uh, in the last two months prior to election. But <laughs> Which candidate exactly. is so, the uh, sitting vice president or the former for, president? So I, I think bets are off. So I think data. the market's kind of pricing in a Trump victory based on what the market has done because he's not going to be a new a new president. But either by case being, you look at going back to 1938, every every presidential election year, the market has gone up and averaged a significant amount, especially because we have seasonality too. You know, uh, December, uh, October, December. Uh, January tend to be yeah November through May is the best correct, time of year correct so um, yeah. sell in May and go away we got to remember to buy in September and October or you'll miss out on that yeah, rally right yeah well we'll we'll see what happens what and what what the market holds for us this time but at the end of the day the market doesn't care who's who's the sitting president it, it's based on earnings and mm -hmm. valuations and again the debt it's just crazy there's a there's a great website called i don't know if you've heard of it um let me pull it up real quick it is was this a national yeah debt the clock? us debt clock dot org yeah, it's and, and it's great. just you want to really <laughs> i stopped looking a few years ago because the numbers it, got too big i mean 35 trillion you know a trillion of that one with a t is just in, interest carry which we've talked about before just on our, our Debt, mm -hmm. but the the concerning part of this is the debt to GDP at one hundred and thirty five percent because debts are all relative, just like a business. If your revenue is outgrowing it, then you're good, and that's not the case now. And that has always been the case going back to nineteen sixty. You've been running about fifty percent debt to G GDP, and now we're at one hundred and thirty. And it's I bring this up because this this is it's not talked about during debates. Well, there's, there hasn't been many. Um, and no one has a plan to tackle this debt and the feds in a tight spot with interest rates and you know bond market has kind of has kind of gone down the last couple of weeks with interest rates slightly going up with some possible new inflation concerns uh but this has got to this can't get kicked down the road much longer 35 trillion and 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 counting yeah, well, let's move on from the base case scenario and talk about the two, we'll say, sweeps. So we'll talk about the Republican sweep first and the Democratic sweep second. And I think that that's where you're kind of going with this, which is if there is a Republican sweep or a Democratic sweep, it empowers them to spend right. a lot of money. And the only thing that's going to stop either one is, you know, commonly known as bond, bond vigilantes, which is to say that interest rates spike because of that spending package. And that's the thing that prevents them from passing all these bills. And both candidates have said no taxes on tips. Well, you know what? We might even tax uh, civic workers. So if you're a firefighter or a police officer, no income tax for you. And it's just kind of this giveaway that I don't think will materialize. But, you know, there's a lot of campaign promises that happen. Um, so on the Republican side, if you saw a sweep there, what are some of the outcomes that we'd be concerned about? And what are some of the we'll say good things that we could be enjoying if that, you know, hopefully the 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 tax cut that Trump put in place um, gets gets extended. But, you know, to that point, if, if even if they sweep, you know, go back to 2016, it could, took him two years to pa to pass the uh, the uh, Job Cut Act, uh, the and mm -hmm. the Tax Cut and Job Cut Job Act. Job Act. I can't speak today. Um, tax and, and, and yeah, and, and it, commonly known as the Trump yeah, tax cuts. There you go. Thank you. Um, and they had a <laughs> they had a comfortable margin in both the Senate and the House, and it took them a while to pass that. So, and they couldn't they couldn't reform Obamacare. So, I, I you know I don't know. Yeah. I think these are all good things. I don't think much is going to get done. Which long term, I think we're all going to end up paying for it down the road. But yeah, I, I'm hoping for a Republican sweep. I think we'll see better returns out of the market if I if you're holding my feet to the fire. Um, but let's go on the other side of the coin. What do you think happens if there's a, a Democratic sweep? <laughs> yeah, look, um, I think this is actually the easier scenario. Uh, and I would start by saying, you know, the bull, or the bull market in stocks is two years old. Uh, and bull markets don't typically die of old age. Uh, two is not that old, but once you hit two, it tends to go for five. Uh, but the thing that stops them is a recession or, you know, basically if the bull market gets murdered. And I think a Democratic sweep would absolutely kill the markets. And there's a couple of reasons why. Number one is we're going to have an expiration of that tax cut bill. And if that happens, January 1st of 2026, everybody's taxes are going up. 
And if that's the case, household spending is a good, it's, it's going to decline. It, it just, it has to, right? If you have less money in your paycheck, you have less to spend. And, you know, I don't think people are going to take on debt just to keep it going uh, if they know that they're going to have more taxes to pay. Uh, the second part is there's been campaign pledges or expectations from that side of the aisle saying that they'll increase taxes on the estate tax. They'll increase taxes on people who have $100 million net worth and above. They've talked about having a wealth tax. Uh, they've talked about taxing unrealized gains. So if there was a sweep, the first thing you're going to see, and what I would suggest to clients as you know, kind of acting as a fiduciary, you should take all the capital gains you can right now because you need to reset. Otherwise, two years from now, that 80% gain that you have in the S&P 500 from the last two years, which I think is actually closer to 60, that could potentially get taxed as unrealized gains. But if we reset it as zero today, we'll pay our 23.8%. Uh, and who knows, at least in the future, we'll have a less realized gain that we can deal with. Uh, it's just, I, yeah, I think, and I'll be, I'll be, I'll say it for, that's a lot of selling. I'll pressure. say it for the that? record. There's, there's no way, there's no way. I don't even know if it's mathematically possible to tax unrealized gains. And when I say that, I mean, keep track of it. And it, it just, it doesn't even add up. It doesn't even make sense. How do you tax someone's house that's appreciated? I um, mean, that's a very definition of inflation. <laughs> Tom, are you, do you pay property tax? You mm. live in Texas. Yeah. Is that a wealth tax on an it asset is. that you own? And you might not even own the entire asset. The bank probably owns 80% of it or 70% of it or some amount. You might only own 20 or 30% of it, but you're paying taxes on the total value yep. of that asset. So that is a wealth tax. So that, that'd be number one. There, there's real estate. We solved for that one. Uh, when it comes to unrealized gain, look at somebody like Elon Musk when it comes to Tesla, right? You can say, well, he bought the shares at this cost basis. Now it's worth that. And it's, you know, we'll say $50 billion of gains. And they can just say you have to do it. Now, it creates a lot of problems. There's going to be a lot of fights. Uh, so but a lot of countries have a wealth tax. And, you know, it's a top evasion thing. And people hide money in mattresses, hide money abroad. And I think it's going to create a lot of problems if they try to create one. Uh, but it's not unique. We wouldn't be the first I ones to have one. And I'm not advocating uh, for it. I'm just oh, saying I don't. I don't consider that a wealth tax, unrealized gains. What a, you know, you sell that stock, or you buy that, or you pay the tax on that stock, and that stock goes down. Then what? Do you get to offset that for for your gains? I mean, it's just I, the IRS is already behind. There's <laughs> unrealized losses. I get it credits. Man, that'd be yeah, clever. So I, I think the I think the bigger concern is capital gains tax going to ordinary income, and I think. The, yeah, that's a good one to pivot to. Yeah, Let's talk about that. And that's a big one. I mean, one advantage you have of, of capital gains tax is it's taxed at 20 or 25%, depending on your tax bracket. And if you hold that investment for over a year, um, you're taxed at that advantageous rate versus if you're in the highest tax bracket, call it, you know, maybe 38, 39%, and then state income tax, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge advantage for especially clients who are retired that are taking income for dividend paying stocks. That goes to ordinary income. It makes it a whole lot less attractive. You know, bonds right now, when you invest in a bond, it's taxed at ordinary income. So they have a place in the portfolio, but you have to figure it, factor in taxes because if you're at the highest tax bracket, that four and a half, five percent bond interest doesn't look as attractive as maybe a five percent dividend on on a stock. Yeah, I, I think that's an important distinction. And the long-term capital gains today, if you're married filing jointly, up to $94,000 of income is zero. So that's a pretty sweet deal for those folks. If you're between 94000 and 583 for your AGI, it's at 15%. Now, when you get over 200 and some change, you get hit with that net investment income tax, which is the Medicare surcharge of 3.8%. So a little higher there. But if you're at the top level, the tax rate is 20% plus that 3.8. So we'll round up and say it's 24 but if you switch that to ordinary income, you're paying 37 at the federal level, plus in some states like California and New York, we'll say anywhere from 10 to 13% on top of that. And then some cities like New York City have their own tax as well. You could be looking at an excess of 50% on your ordinary income tax rate, as well as capital gains rate, if they make that change up from 23.8. So a more than double that that's going to impact. Yeah, and everyone. that'll rethink how you invest and where you invest and the thing and the and the and the biggest area of the market's going to get hit are, are individual stocks, especially the, the, the value mm -hmm. stocks, because it's just you're not being compensated now as much for the risk and the volatility because you're now at the same tax rate as you were as you would be to invest in, in a bond. So I think if again, to your point, if there's a Democratic suite, I think the estate attorneys are going to be busy. The CPAs are going to be busy next week or next year. And we are certainly going to be busy trying to figure out the loopholes and the best ways to get to create tax efficient income and, and returns.
if you're looking for the latest information on financial planning and investment management, check out our blog at gwadvisors.net backslash blog. You'll find informative articles on retirement readiness, risk management, asset allocation, estate planning and business succession. You can also join over 10,000 listeners every other week for some witty banter on the Your Money Momentum podcast. Listen in at gwadvisors.net backslash podcast. And remember, you can always get your questions answered by emailing us at info at gwadvisors.net. We're here to help you succeed. Yeah, tax planning is always valuable. And we talked about that in a previous episode. So let's move on from the election. We've laid out base case and some extreme cases and move to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act Sunset Provision Comparison Guide, which we have available if you send us a message at info at gwadvisors.net. And we compare what tax rates are today in 2024, what they're going to be in 2025, and what happens once that expires. And as you can see, we'll hit some of the highlights in this conversation. Uh, it's a big difference. And I, I'd like to start with the change in the standard deduction, because one of the things that happened was we increase, we being the government, uh, increase the standard deduction very significantly, and it reverts back to the old number. So based on inflation, today, 29200 is your standard deduction for married filing jointly and half that for those who are single. If it expires, it reverts to the old number, increasing from inflation again, be 15750 and for single, 7850 for that standard deduction. In addition, the rates are going to go up. So you have a two-part increase in tax. So if you're not deducting that amount, that fourteen thousand dollars now getting taxed, and let's just say you're at a reasonable fifteen or twenty five percent bracket, that's another chunk of thousands of dollars that you're going to have to come up with to pay your taxes. Yeah, it's a, it's a significant amount. Um, you know, we mentioned the the estate planning as well. Um, the the lifetime exemption amount is going to get cut in half, which is which is huge, um, and that might bring a lot of more people into the fold to do estate planning right now. You know, because it's inflated. Mm -hmm. If you're married, filing joint, it's call it twenty four million is your lifetime exemption amount. So you can gift. Well, so it's actually higher. So the adjusted for inflation, so it's thirteen point six million per person. So for a married couple, it's even higher at twenty seven million, and it gets cut in a significant way down to 6.8. So married finally jointly, you know, great. But I mean, that's a pretty big drop off. I don't know how many people have more than $13 million uh, yeah, so 20, in the country. 24, but. 27 million. It's a rounding error, Kevin. Um, when you got that much money, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but no, that's a good point because inflation has been so high. I didn't even realize it was inflated that, that much, but that's going to go down and get cut yeah. in half. So, you know, if you're going to have over a call it, what, 13, $12 million estate, um, anything above that is going to be taxed at a 40% tax rate. So that's real estate investments, whatever it may be, you can give up to that amount out to beneficiaries, loved ones, whomever, but anything above that limit, you're giving 40% of that to the IRS. And that's big too for landowners, because if there's a death in the family and kids inherit property, they're going to have to probably be forced to sell to pay that tax burden. And there's ways to offset it through insurance and other estate planning strategies. But I think it's going to bring it could bring a lot more people into the into the fold. Yeah, I mean, for somebody like that, you, you're going to have a nice stepped up in cost basis. So capital gains, even if they are changed, that won't hurt you as much for the inheritor. But the inheritance on that estate tax is going to be significant. And having that yep. big number is really helpful. And what I would tell people is you may want to hurry to your estate attorney's office and do some planning now. You can use that exemption today and it won't get taken away later and say, well, you can't do that. Um, and if it goes up in the future just from inflation and it goes from 13.6 to 15, you can use that additional exemption later as well. So there's kind of a no lose situation other than if you take it out of your estate, it's no longer yours. So consider some strategies to get stuff out of your uh, estate as soon as possible, especially if you think that this is going to expire. And, and now we no, I was just yeah, going to say, I mean, you know, 13 million is, is a lot to a lot of people and most of us probably won't be there at the end of our lives, but that could get cut even more. So it doesn't, you don't have to have 13 million to start estate planning and those assets do appreciate over time. So yeah, to your point, I would, there's planning you can do now to, to soak up some of that exemption through trust, et cetera. And, uh, it always makes sense to, to plan ahead on that part. Yeah. So the thing that's not going to change, if you make adjusted gross income of $38,000 or less, your tax rate is going to basically be the same. Now you have 
because it goes up to 23,000 for that 10%. And then you have the married filing jointly standard deduction of 15. That's how I came up with the 38 number. Uh, everybody else above that of 38,000 in household income is going to see their taxes rise if this just expires. So we have the 12% bracket go to 15, 22 goes to 25, um, the 24 goes to 28. And really it's a broad increase in rates as well as cutting those brackets down. So you're going to have a lot more people who get captured in those rates and it's going to be problematic. And, you know, this is where there's an opportunity to do some tax planning. If you're somebody that may be still working and not retired and not taking RMDs, it could make sense to convert a portion of your IRA into a Roth IRA, pay the taxes now, knowing or expecting that later on your RMDs may jump and be higher and your taxes will be higher as well. So the last piece I would mention is just the state and local income tax. Right now that's capped at $10,000. Um, there has been talk about raising that to 25 as part of a deal. So if we were to get divided government, I'd expect that deal to be around that amount. Uh, the old rule, it was unlimited. So states that had high personal income taxes or high property taxes, you could deduct all that. And then it ended up getting very beneficial to the states, less money for the federal government. Uh, the only other change would be this mortgage interest going from 750 to a million. That has not been indexed for inflation. And we know that housing prices have jumped you know, in excess of 40% in the last four years. It probably should have changed, but it was capped and it didn't change. Um, in addition, you know, there's some child tax credits and some minor things, but you know, we did hit on all the big things. So uh, we'll look forward to catching up after. Yep, sounds good. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. Standard deduction changes as well as rate changes. And if you have more, Uh, Tom. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.